Well, Proxima B. It feels like a while since I last tackled my most popular topic, but I've recently come across a paper by a group of scientists at the Met Office, the British Weather Prediction Service, who have applied the organization's computer models to the alien climate of Proxima B. Of course, I should say at this point that I will be assuming that you have already seen my previous video on Proxima B. If not, check the link in the description. That video featured a climate model put forward by a group of French and English scientists that presented a fairly welcoming vision of the world, given a few assumptions about atmospheric composition. Shortly after its release, in February of this year, NASA cited a paper published in the Astronomical Journal that argued that the flares and violent outbursts common to red dwarf stars like Proxima would eventually strip an orbiting planet's atmosphere of its oxygen, rendering it unfit for complex life. This new climate model, released just this month, has been cited as a riposte to the Astronomical Journal letter, but makes no reference to it. In fact, it states baldly that its simulated world's atmosphere possesses biotic or biogenic gases, such as oxygen, ozone, or methane, with no assertions as to how any of it got there. It does, however, suggest that if Proxima b were habitable, it would remain so over a wide range of possible orbital configurations, far more than initially supposed. Before we begin, I must say again that I am not a scientist, and any conclusions I reach from reading that paper should be taken with a pinch of salt. I'll include a link to the paper in the description for anyone who might want to educate me on whatever I got wrong. The new simulation uses the Met Office Unified Model, a single computer model of the entire atmosphere that will form the core of the Met Office's contribution to the next intergovernmental panel on climate change. The model that the Met Office produced for Proxima b is, in many ways, quite similar to the French and German model, although it is somewhat colder, rainier, and cloudier. It is a British model, after all. On the most uncertain quality of Proxima b, its size, the new model assumes a radius of 1.1 times that of the Earth, in line with the lower end of the mass estimates. The model also assumes an atmosphere of the same density as Earth's. An improbable assumption, perhaps, but then we still don't know how common planets like ours really are. The model was run for both a 1 to 1 and a 2 3 resonance, that is, eternal day and eternal night, versus one year of day and one year of night, and also for a variety of eccentricities, from 0, meaning the orbit was perfectly circular, to 0 0.3 the highest value allowed by observation, which would give it an orbit similar in shape to Pluto's. The model also posits that Proxima b receives about two-thirds the amount of sunlight Earth gets, with the radiation peaking in the roughly one micron wavelength, what we would call the near-infrared, rather than our sun's roughly half a micron, what we would call visible light. This creates a kind of backwards greenhouse effect in Proxima b's stratosphere. On Earth, shortwave visible light from the sun is absorbed by our planet and re-radiated as infrared light, which is then absorbed by the carbon dioxide and water vapor in our air and increases the ambient temperature. On Proxima b, the incoming sunlight is itself infrared, and so absorbed by the greenhouse gases in its atmosphere before it reaches the ground, making its stratosphere much warmer and wetter than ours, and its surface colder. The model makes no allowances for land, assuming the entire world to be covered in water. The selling point, if that's the word, of this new paper is that it predicts that, due to a combination of the spectrum of Proxima sunlight and the planet's tidal locking, a habitable Proxima b would remain so over a wider range of possible orbits than Earth. The model also produced similar habitable outcomes under a wide range of atmospheric compositions, including a far lower oxygen level. While all this sounds promising, the paper's description of the treasures of planet Proxima does not exactly stir my pioneer's heart. For a planet in a one-to-one -one resonance, the model predicts a day side with a central eye of warm temperatures under a permanent veil of cloud. Don't get too optimistic. That flaming eye of searing heat? It represents a maximum temperature of 290 kelvins, which may seem like a lot, but is in fact 17 degrees Celsius, or 62 Fahrenheit. That's the maximum. You see, cloud has a high albedo, which means it reflects a lot of the incoming radiation into space, which keeps the lower layers nice and cool. While the area around the eye would be relatively dry, the eye itself would be a wash of constant rain. On this habitable planet, the most you could hope for is a permanent rain-soaked afternoon at just below room temperature. I could see the adventure stories now. Captain Tom Rapid of the Interstellar Colonial Action Force stood alone on a hill, his eye glaring into the unknown. As he drew his Mark IV recoilless plasma blaster from its holster, he curled his lip and said, 
Damn, it's waterlogged again. And the night side? No clouds, no water vapor. Just raw air holding back hard, frigid space. Temperatures there are expected to hit 150 kelvins, which is minus 123 degrees Celsius, or minus 190 Fahrenheit. Stand there for any length of time, and you will pine for the balmy shores of Antarctica. As noted in my previous video on Proxima, atmospheric transfer of heat from the day side, combined with oceanic transfer from the night side, could keep the planet's atmosphere from completely freezing out. But all that guarantees is the ability to breathe, not that your lungs won't seize up afterwards. A planet with a 3-2 resonance, that is to say, each side getting alternately a full 11-day year of daylight followed by 11 days of night, is not really any more inviting. Rather than the Scottish Highlands on one side and Mars with air on the other, now we see a more evenly spread miserableness, though the details change depending on the shape of the planet's orbit. In the highly unlikely event that such a world has a perfectly circular orbit, it would maintain a, barely, habitable equatorial band, about as wide as the previous models, but in an even lower temperature of 280K, that is, just 7 degrees Celsius or 45 degrees Fahrenheit, a temperature one could best describe as technically not freezing. At the blistering height of summer, you might see temperatures of 295K, which is 22 Celsius or 71 Fahrenheit. If you stretched the world's orbit out a bit, in technical terms, if you increased its eccentricity from zero to its maximum predicted value of 0 0.3, we would see temperatures overall increase, but concentrated in two hot spots on either side of the planet. The planet would have an almost complete cloud cover, stretching 60 degrees latitude on either side of the equator, with what the paper describes as, quote, enhanced precipitation of about 3,000 millimeters per year. Again, as someone who lives in Britain, I'm beginning to feel right at home. And finally, in keeping with the theme of this episode, I would like to mention an erratum from my previous Proxima B video. I said that it was convection rather than rotation that produces a rotating magnetic field in a planet, but I should have clarified that it was convection in the liquid outer core, rather than, as I had suggested, the mantle. I didn't learn this fact until after I had uploaded the video. Sorry, everyone. <laughs>